This video is the third in a series. Your ultimate goal should be that hands-on lab right there on the bottom. Uh, this is provider versus tenant network. So what we want to do is have it clearly understood what the difference is between these two types of networks. Then Zach is going to come in and show you how to actually wire all of this stuff up using the OpenStack commands. So here's an example showing the network function virtualization to create a tenant network. In this particular case, both of these virtual machines are connected on the same tenant and the traffic flow couldn't be simpler. It's just like this. So we see a Linux tap to a Linux bridge where the uh, security uh, group is running uh, to a bridge internal connections through the integration bridge. Now, more importantly, what I want you to observe is that Virtual Machine 1 and Virtual Machine 2 are in the cloud. Nova built all of this. Nova knew the source, Nova knew the destination. And as long as we tell Nova the name of the integration bridge, it wires everything up for us. So the command to create the network that actually allows these to be network is really straightforward because all the hard work is done in the naming of all this stuff. Now, let's take a look at that same diagram, this time at a higher level, because I think it might be interesting to introduce the fact that there might be more than one compute node. In fact, there would be many of them. What if I have two virtual machines running on the same compute node? First of all, I want you to observe that the traffic flow is tremendously efficient. If these two virtual machines are talking to each other, the traffic stays on the same compute node, staying within the integration bridge, never leaving. In this particular case, we see that both the source and the destination are the same tenant, it's on the same compute node, and it's on the same subnet. Now, what if we have an example where it is the same tenant, but a different compute node, and, and it's still the same subnet? Well, in that particular case, as long as OpenStack knows what the name of this VLAN bridge is, and it does because we told it, then what OpenStack is going to do is it's going to select from a pool of VLANs. So let's say we create a pool of 400 VLANs. Then OpenStack is free to choose whichever one it wants to of that pool, and it would then effectively use that particular VLAN up to uh, network everything in this yellow VLAN. So the traffic that you'd see, again, couldn't be simpler. It's simply tagged with a VLAN tag and remained between the two. Now, hopefully you're, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, this doesn't look as efficient as if both of these virtual machines would be on the same compute node. And I would agree with you. Uh, and there's no reason when you're deploying the virtual machines, if you know they're going to be very chatty, put them on the same compute node then. But you know, that being said, this still works fine. And since we're trying to understand the difference between provider nets and uh, tenant networks, this is a tenant network. Why? Both the source and the destination are within OpenStack. And it was within OpenStack's ability to build all the network function virtualization. It handled all of that for us. So now, what if we have a situation where it's the same tenant the same compute node, but it's a different subnet. So I'm showing VM1, the yellow one, as uh, the same tenant as VM2, but they're on different subnets. So I made the purple one a different color. Again, the traffic flow couldn't be simpler. And the way that the people in OpenStack figured this one out is that OpenStack creates a network namespace. It installs two bridge internals. It puts the the rules in place with uh, IP tables and voila, a uh, Router created right out of thin air, and now we have a router running between these two subnets. It works just great, and it does pass the rule. And the rule being, both the source and destination are within OpenStack. The OpenStack mechanism itself was able to build all of this. Didn't have to read anyone's mind. It said, okay, same tenant. So OpenStack will create the uh, quantum router and wire all this up for us. Our last example of a tenant network is what if we have the same tenant, different compute nodes, and different subnets, other than some asymmetry in the way the packets flow. 
probably no surprise. What you're going to see happen is when traffic leaves the yellow subnet, it's actually routed onto the purple guy's subnet on the originating end. Now we're actually in the correct VLAN so that the destination requires no routing. It goes right straight in. When you look at the path returning, the same thing but on the other side. So there's a bit of asymmetry in this, but it's actually quite elegant. So if I run the animation for you, again, you'll see the traffic flow working like this on the on the egress and egress, uh, ingress and egress relative to virtual machine number one. Now, finally, let's talk about provider networks. So, the number one, the organization that built and paid for the hardware that runs OpenStack is called the provider. So the provider wrote the check and built all of this. The provider installs connectivity to the outside of the cloud, or this won't be very interesting. Now that external connectivity could be internet, it could be enterprise local area networks, or whatever networks you would, would care to connect. So this is the distinguishing factor right here. OpenStack can't read our minds in this particular case. If we're going to somewhere outside of the cloud, then that is a service that's provided by the provider, hence the name provider network. So we say that these networks that connect to the outside are called provider networks. And only an OpenStack admin can create a, pri a provider network. So in this particular case, we see the virtual machine passing through a router, for reasons I'm going to explain in a moment, through a provider access, and then on to the outside. Only an admin can build this, because uh, OpenStack can't figure this one out. We have to configure this so, so that when the, once the provider network is built, if you attach to this network, it's guaranteed to go to wherever that destination is. And incidentally, you can have lots of provider networks. You're not restricted to just one. So let's hop back to that network function virtualization and take a look at the wiring. So I'm going to put a divider line right here. And I'm going to show you that the part that connects right here is actually a tenant network. The other part, the part that continues on out of the cloud, is the provider network. Now, without playing around with any configuration, without uh, doing some permissions modification, a tenant is certainly allowed to create its own tenant network. A tenant is allowed to create this router. A tenant is certainly allowed to create an interface to the router that connects to the tenant's network. If the provider network is shared, then the tenant is allowed to create that other interface which connects to the provider network. So Zach is going to show you this shortly. So you're going to see he'll create the router, then he'll create the uh, interface on the inside, he'll create the interface on the outside, and now it might make more sense if we take a look at the rest of this flow by sort of obfuscating the background like this, and let's just take a look at the flow itself. So what we have now is a provider network that has a certain IP address range. And here's the thing. The IP address range that the tenant creates up here can be whatever the tenant wants. The IP address range that the tenant creates could actually step on the provider network's IP address range. And, and we all know that if you run into a situation like that, the solution is NAT. So unless you play around with the config files, when that connection to the provider network is built, the router is definitely given an IP address on the provider network and the router will perform a NAT function. Specifically, what will happen is a floating IP address will be configured by the tenant to point to that virtual machine. And this is a one-to-one -one assignment. So when a floating IP address is assigned, it is pointed directly to that virtual machine and no other virtual machine. So interestingly, the virtual machine has an IP address from the tenant network. The virtual machine has no idea that a floating IP address was assigned to it, nor does the virtual machine even know what the floating IP address is. But here's the thing, if you're in the outside world out here and you want to get to that virtual machine, knowing the virtual machine's IP address is not going to help you. You actually have to know how to get to the floating IP address, which uh, actually in the network function virtualization is assigned to the outside interface of the router. Uh, 
the OpenStack configuration of the router itself is smart enough to perform the NAT and relay the traffic into the virtual machine. Now, I'm going to assume at this stage that there's going to be questions because there always is in class. And rather than avoid uh, typing out an answer every time this question comes in, I'm going to answer it right now. And here's the question. Can I connect directly to the provider router? I don't like this floating IP address. I don't want this floating IP address. I, I am an enterprise. We, we don't do that. This is like Amazon Elastic IP. We're considerably smaller than that. And the answer is, of course you can. Uh, but we're going to have to tweak a few things. Namely, in the Etsy Nova policy.json file, we're going to have to find a rule that's titled just like this, that network colon attach external network, and we're going to scratch out that only the admin can do it. We've got to get rid of that, leaving nothing but those two quotation marks right there. Now, as soon as this rule is applied, then tenants are going to be allowed to attach this virtual machine right to the provider net skipping the floating IP address and all that stuff, making it look a, a lot like a, a classic VMware deployment. Now, just eyes wide open on this, guys, as to what just happened. Yes, it's really nice because if, for instance, if I had a load balancer or another service out there, I could bring traffic into here and we have layer two connectivity because, man, they are on the same subnet, right straight up there. But, yeah, that, that's great. That works. I just want you to realize that, look at it from the other perspective. If you do it this way, a really powerful virtual machine just got layer two connectivity to a provider network. Now, if the provider network is your network, well, fine, it's your virtual machine and it's your network. But if, if you're a service provider and you're selling these services, the likelihood of you allowing your tenant to do something like this is extremely low, but it is possible. So that brings us to the end of the provider versus tenant networks. If you made it this far, uh, the coup de grace is actually the last video uh, right down there. That's the hands-on lab. Zach is going to walk you through that. Uh, and if you got this far, uh, definitely that's the one to take. Good luck on the certified OpenStack exam, by the way.